Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to EMCCM conference, uh, starting out with a 65 year old male coming in with diarrhea and malaise. It's me, Paul, you all know me by now. Uh, thanks again to the EMCCM team for all of their help. Starting with a little pre-hospital history, now that we know the start of the complaint, 65 year old gentleman having weakness, diarrhea, reduced appetite, a little left side of abdominal pain for about three days. He's got a heart rate of 77, blood pressure of 71 over 46 in the field. He's alert, interactive, intact airway breathing circulation, but pale and dry mucous membranes. As far as interventions done by EMS, they placed a 22 gauge IV because they're not a county intern and didn't place an 18. They got about 200 cc's of normal saline in him by the time he arrived. A dopamine infusion was started at five mics per kg per minute. He was placed in the shock position, which is with his legs elevated to give him a little extra preload. And he was transported without incident to Kings County. For our initial assessment, um, nothing really significant here. His airway is intact. He's got bilateral pair breast sounds. He's alert. He's got normal pulses, cap refill, less than two seconds, and warm extremities. He is uh, moving all extremities spontaneously, awake and oriented. As far as his vital signs go, he's got a heart rate of 89, uh, respiratory rate of 17, blood pressure of 89 over 59, temperature of 98.4, OT sat of 99% on Romare, and a glucose of 127. Problem list we have so far is hypertension and his complaints of abdominal pain and diarrhea. As far as initial interventions, started out with cardiac monitor, pulse oximetry, 18 gauge IV access, uh, additional fluids hung. Is, EKG was ordered as well as an ultrasound. For a little further HPI, patients had about three days of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, reduced appetite and fatigue. He hasn't had any fevers or chills, no bloody or coffee grown emesis, no melanin or hematochesia, no sick contacts or recent travel. Review systems is otherwise negative. For past medical history, he does have epilepsy, for which he's on Depakote, Capra, and Oxcarbazepine. Had a traumatic subarachnoid from a seizure. Had lung cancer, which was stable for only for the malignant diffusion component, no other meds. I uh, got chemo and immunotherapy, now clear of disease. Diabetes, hypertension, and an old left foot ulcer that's healed in the earlier part of the year. For social history, he uh, does use marijuana, but no, nothing else illicit, um, nothing else really specific in his social history. Was born in another country, but has been living in Brooklyn for years. Of course, his general appearance, he's no acute distress, but he is a little ill-appearing. Uh, for his head and neck, he does have dry mucous membranes, but otherwise doesn't have any lesions or, or anything else of note. Normal cardiovascular exam, normal S1 and S2 regular rate and rhythm. Um, lungs are clear at auscultation. He needs not in any respiratory distress at the initial evaluation. His abdomen soft, non tender, non distended, no melanin or blood on digital rectal exam. As far as extremities and skin, he does have this left foot healed ulcer and some poor skin turker, but he's got nothing else. And, and they did check for things like a sacral decubitus ulcer. For neuromuscular, he's alert at times three, and he doesn't have any focal motor or sensory deficit. Can some folks out in the audience help me out with the differential diagnosis? Anything? You can say it out loud, you can type in the chat. All right, dehydration, good. Anything else? Come on. Gastroenteritis, mesenteric ischemia, viral GI syndrome. Good. So we do have some, we have hypotension. We've got relative bradycardia with it, which is a little strange. Could be septic. Uh, obviously, with the diarrhea, we're thinking about hypovolemic, and hemorrhagic is there too. Um, and finally, cardiogenic, just in case there's a cardiogenic component, is he on beta blockers? Is he on anything else that's causing his heart rate to be artificially low? Um, GI bleed is, of course, there, as well as many different kinds of abdominal uh, disease, uh, mesenteric ischemia being a pretty serious one, but especially with, uh, without the pain on exam. Um, but he's at uh, risk of 
uh, bowel obstruction given his prior cancer history, and then he could have just any of the other usual abdominal uh, components of, uh, of any kind of illness. Here's our EKG. Um, I'll just interpret this one. There isn't a lot to really chase here. He does have LVH. He has Q waves, which are pretty small relative to the uh, R complex. So that might just be a consequence of the LVH. Obviously, our lead quality in 2,3 AVF is not so great, but the but on subsequent EKGs, there wasn't really anything um, special up there. Inside ultrasonography, we have a mildly reduced EF, no D sign, uh, no pericardial effusion, and his IVC is collapsed. Uh, no rush exam was performed at that time. So what would you guys do from here as far as blood tests, imaging, consults, anything like that? Throw, you throw things out in the chat. Anything? Perfect. CBC comp, shock, type and screen, rainbows. Excellent, that's a good start. Um, we have, uh, old, in the end, we get uh, CBC comp, mag boss, blood gas, troponin, UA. We get a Depakote level, uh, get some blood cultures and some urine cultures and a chest x-ray. For our blood gas, there isn't anything really interesting here. We do we have a pH of 7.3, which is a little acidotic. It seems to be more of a respiratory than a metabolic component if you trust the bicarb here. Um, his lactate is 2.8, which is high, but nothing crazy. And his anion gap, if you calculate it from the blood gas, is only 15. Uh, unreliable as those can be, but at least as a starting point, there isn't anything terrifically standing out here. Um, as far as the rest of his lab testing, uh, there are a couple of abnormalities here. Uh, we have an elevated white count, which if you want to look at the differential, you do have elevated neutrophil. And if you're interested in something like the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, this is definitely on the higher side of that as a nonspecific uh, indicator of serious illness. Hemoglobin is a little bit low compared to his baseline. It's a 3.4 uh, drop for over the past month. Uh, we don't really have an obvious source at this time. Sodium is a little low at 126, uh, low chloride to go with it. His bion and creatinine are a little bit hiked. Uh, he's got a pretty high bion and creatinine ratio. It's over 20 to 1. He's COVID negative. His troponin is a little bit elevated compared to his baseline. But valproic acid is slightly subtherapeutic. Chest radiograph, uh, I'll, as far as interpreting this one, mostly just an enlarged cardiac silhouette, some increased interstitial markings, um, nothing grossly wrong with this one. An updated problem list, we have a shock of unclear etiology. We have hyponatremia, which is probably hypovolemic, was the thinking. He's got anemia with the hemoglobin drop, unclear why, and he's got an AKI, which we suspect might be pre-renal. As far as our ED course, uh, his blood pressure improved after two liters of fluid and the dopamine was discontinued. A GI consult was pursued to uh, evaluate for the possible cause of hemoglobin drop as a possible GI cause. He was also given protonics, uh, 40 milligrams. Patient was ultimately disposed to the medicine floors for further rehydration, for trending of all of those abnormal labs and to follow that GI consult. Hospital day one, he gets that GI consult. Uh, they recommend PPI, BID, keep him MPO, and do a full anemia workup just in case it's something non-GI, given that he doesn't have any other findings on exam. Hospital day two, um, around six in the morning, his respiratory rate starting to pick up and his blood pressures are starting to drift down. Mickey consults pursued. They recommended rehydration as a transfusion of one unit of PRBC, given the possibility that he's losing blood. However, on hospital uh, later in that afternoon, um, he's still not looking well. His blood pressure hasn't really improved. Uh, Mickey reevaluates him to find bilateral rails and B lines, and his fluids are stopped. Around 6 p.m. that day, his respiratory rate is still quite high. His blood pressure is uh, still on the lower side and with a pretty uh, wide gap between systolic and diastolic. BiPAP has started at uh, I of 12 and E of 5, and then if I have 2 of 100%. Blood cultures do come back with gram-positive cocci and clusters as a prelim. 
Van Gensosen are started. By around 8 p.m., his plot pressures are coming down yet again. He isn't really improving on BiPAP. He's accepted at NICU and started on leave with them. This is a chest x-ray from just a few hours later. Can someone please read this for me? Or, at least, or tell me in brief what's wrong with it. Thank you, Shane. Very helpful comments. There is indeed schmutz anywhere. Is there any, is there any pattern to the bad lung syndrome as Ryan Walsh puts? Any specific, anything at all? An area that might not be affected? Exactly. So the right upper lobe is clear and the left upper lobe is actually not as bad as the rest of the lung. So it does seem to have a bit of a dependent fashion. In the ICU, pretty soon after that chest x-ray, his respiratory function is worsening. His O2 sets less than 80% um, on 100% of IO2. He's got labored respirations, a code 80 that's called, and the patient's intubated. Central line and A-line are placed, vasopressin is added. This is a post-intubation chest x-ray. You could argue that maybe it looks a little bit improved. Maybe that's the positive pressure from the vent, um, but no significant change here. On hospital day three is when uh, TTE is performed, as seen in this video. Can anyone see the problem or call it out? Yeah, the EF was read as mildly reduced. And there you go, Camila Knight, very nice. This patient was found to have a 1.4 by 1.3 aortic valve mass, found to have severe aortic regurgitation, and almost immediately after those echo results come the blood cultures resulting with staph lugdenesis. So we have an updated problem list, aortic valve mass with aortic regurgitation, hypoxemic respiratory failure, Staph lug bacteriuremia, acute kidney injury, and anemia. Can anyone put this together for me? Of what our diagnosis might be? Endocarditis. Very nice, thank you. So we have aortic valve endocarditis from staph lug denesis causing aortic regurgitation and LV failure. So for our discussion points today, I wanna to talk about using echo for valve assessment. We we're going to talk about some of the uh, different kinds of valvular regions you can have that would be relevant to the emergency department, mostly aortic regurge, mitral regurge, and aortic stenosis. You can briefly brush past some of the other valves or how to uh, have a general approach to valvular lesions and then what our definitive treatment options are. First, most important thing about TTE and valve assessment is you have a stethoscope, use it. Um, it's faster than an ultrasound machine. You can do a full heart exam in the time it takes the ultrasound to turn on. And it can tell you where to look uh, to maybe save you a little bit of time. The first and easiest way to do valve assessment using an echo is actually just to eyeball it. So if we were to start with this view, um, if someone can take a look at that aortic valve, can anyone, does anyone want to say anything about that aortic valve? Any, if you look at the aortic valve in this view about its function, yeah, so the opening, when it opens, is quite small. It's also pretty sclerotic. Keep in mind, you can have aortic sclerosis without having aortic stenosis, um, but the, the point at which your valve becomes thickened and calcified often precedes the part where uh, the valve stops functioning correctly, so it can be an easy way to just highlight the area. Here's that same valve in a cross-sectional view, also with a really uh, small opening. This is a special case of a pretty easily visible regurge. This is actually from rheumatic heart disease. This is called the hockey puck or the hockey stick sign. The, um, in this case, you can see that the, the valve leaflets are not actually co-opting together, which is causing regurge. This patient is also actually having stenosis. Um, just to explain the pseudo uh, aortic stenosis, that's just to say that the valve can become calcified without al actually becoming stenotic. So your valve can be calcified, but you, will, you should still see the valve leaflets opening up very nicely. As far as regurgitation, the easy way to do this without getting into a bunch of crazy math is to just look at the jets going back. 
for the mitral valve, this is actually really easy because you just put a color flow on it and then you see how far that jet is going. It's a little hard to tell what um, the blue or the red means until you look at the left side of your screen where you have a guide. You have the blue going away from your probe and the red going towards it. Um, so you can see that the blue is blowing back from the left ventricle to the left atrium. And you can see it's actually hitting the back wall, which is pretty severe. The way you quantify this is actually just by more or less eyeballing how far uh, the thirds are going down. So if it's going one third of the way towards the back of the left atrial wall, that's mild. If it's two thirds of the way, it's moderate. If it's all the way to the back, that's severe. Aortic regurge is actually a little bit trickier. You can't uh, do any measurement like this in so many of the uh, measurements are dependent on your LV function and your afterload at any given time. Um, the, but the width of the jet's actually what's more useful here. Um, if you have any jet that's a problem, and if you have, if the jet width is, at the narrowest point right as it exits the aortic valve is greater than two thirds of your entire LV outflow track, that's severe. And the grading in between uh, varies depending on who you are. For stenosis, this seems hard, but there have actually been a couple of studies where they trained residents in internal emergency or anesthesia. Um, pretty small residents, so they're probably or well, groups of residents, so they're probably getting lots of attention, but they were evaluating some pretty large uh, patient numbers. Um, there are some pretty good inter-rater reliability of, uh, of usually above 90%, and if the aortic stenosis was severe, that reliability was often closer to 100% for um, them agreeing with a senior ultrasonographer. The way to look for aortic stenosis, um, the briefest and easiest way, there are many more complicated methods for everything I'm talking about, but we're, gonna, we're sticking with easy today. You visualize the AV outflow tract in apical five or apical three, and you take your continuous wave Doppler, um, which should pull up a line on your screen, and you track that through the LV outflow tract at the aortic valve, which should look something like this. Uh, when you measure that, you're going to get some velocity peaks. You're going to measure the highest of those peaks, and that speed is going to be uh, reflective of a degree of aortic stenosis. Um, a little guide here is that anything above 2.5 is abnormal, and anything above 4 is severe. When should you assess valves? Anyone who's having shock or instability plus audible murmur should be the first thing you. Uh, keep an eye out for if you're thinking about this kind of problem. Patients getting worse despite appropriate treatment. If their clinical CHF is looking a lot more compelling than their actual redu reduction in LV ejection fraction, um, that's a good time to look. Remember that if you have mitral regurgitation, your EF will be falsely elevated because you're losing half of the blood uh, going back into the left atrium. If they're hypotensive and pulmonary edema, and it seems like part of the story is like acute pulmonary edema, but not just an APE, um, that might just be instead of cardiogenic shock, and that could be a person where it's worth taking a look because sometimes the management can be different, depending on what you find. So for aortic regurgitation, um, just to start, and just to talk, just when I'm talking about all of these valve lesions, this is all for resuscitating a patient who is hypotensive and crashing in front of you. This has nothing to do with the long-term management. So a couple of important things about um, aortic regurgitation, and one is that the regurgitation is happening during diastole. It's between the beginning and the end of diastole, uh, you get a small lowering of pressure, which is, is a small amount is expected. In regurgitation, however, you're losing a great deal. That loss is represented here. That loss is effectively lost cardiac output. Item number two is that you know, you can't modify the amount of time in diastole directly, but what you can modify is your heart rate. And if, whether you're using exercise or medications or direct pacing, either way, you're going to reduce your time in systole in a linear relationship, but your diastole time will decrease a lot faster. So if you want to decrease the amount of time you're spending in diastole, you want to pick up that heart rate. The other thing driving blood regurgitate back is the pressure from the aorta, which is basically the afterload. Reducing the afterload directly reduces your regurgitate fraction. So this number right here is your enemy. If you can get away with it, if they haven't, as long as they're keeping the afterload compatible with life, that this is an approach to um, helping them with their forward flow. So our rate and contractility, we both want to be high. So a 
one possible medication you can use is dobutamine. There are a lot of different ways to increase contractility and rate. Um, and as far as your afterload goes, you want to keep it low. Nitroprusside is by far the most well-studied medication here, but calcium channel blockers like nectardipine or clavidipine, if you have access to it, might also be good options. There's one special case I want to talk about with aortic dissection. Aortic dissection can cause aortic regurgitation by a couple of different mechanisms. You can blow the leaflets apart from each other physically um, to, by making the aortic valve annulus wider. You can also subduct one valve leaflet past the other, uh, or you can just have rupture to the intima that, uh, that just causes some kind of devastating mechanical complication. The problem about aortic dissection with aortic regurg is that in aortic dissection, usually you want to lower your heart rate and lower your blood pressure. But as we were just talking about with aortic regurgitation, um, you want to keep that heart rate up to reduce the amount of regurgitation you're having. Uh, thankfully, lowering blood pressure is still a target goal for you. Um, so in the end, what are you going to do with it? I did look to see if I could find anyone committing to a um, committing to any option, committing to any numbers, if anyone's ever really studied it. Aortic dissection is already a rare de disease. For them to then get aortic regurgitation and then for you to then study it um, is a very difficult prospect. So it seems like what the general agreement is, is you're going to want to compromise in your heart rate. You do have to maintain a perfusing pressure. Um, there's no way around that. Uh, but obviously, lowering your afterload as much as possible at least can make both of those things better. Uh, obviously, you're going to be wanting to get this person to an operating room. I don't think I have to say anything about the fact that this patient's incredible. As far as mitral regurgitation, um, your main causes of acute mitral regurgitation uh, include papillary muscle rupture, endocarditis, and trauma. Uh, rarely, someone with mitral valve prolapse can eventually rupture the chordae tendon ATO. Here we have a pressure wave tracing. Um, you can note that the LA pressure is actually going up during systole. That it, wave going upwards is also lost cardiac output. So all of this here is uh, in a, going to the wrong place and not perfusing the rest of your organs. The main problem during is, of course, that during systole, you're dumping blood into your left atrium, which then gets dumped back and forth. You'll pretty quickly cause left atrial uh, pressure increases and volume increases. Um, this is a you can't really do much to affect the atria specifically, but what you can manipulate is your aortic pressures. And so your goal here also is to reduce afterload uh, in order to promote the percent of your ejection fraction that is actually going forward. Um, as far as your heart rate and contractility goes here, because you're reducing afterload and you want to keep your pressures up, you may have to increase your contractility just to keep the forward flow going. In addition, these patients can be prone to getting volume overloaded in their left ventricle, for which it's actually beneficial to keep a high contractility and high heart rate, just to keep the volume in your LV from getting overwhelming and for, to keep your LV from distending. For management, this is actually mostly quite similar to your, uh, to your aortic regurgitation management. Keep your rate and contractility high, keep your afterload low. Um, the other thing here is that for mitral valve lesions, they can be a little bit more preload sensitive than others since the mitral valve and the left atria can get trapped between the left ventricle and the pulmonary vasculature. So uh, increased fluids can cause distension, can cause dis uh, dilation of the uh, mitral valve annulus. And if, as far as the special case of papillary muscle rupture, a um, couple of specific notes about this. These patients are extremely sick because they have at baseline, for the most common case of the missed MI, this is a patient who's already had a missed MI, so they've already at least had one thing going wrong with them. And then now you've added on the fact that they've had an acute valve rupture too. Um, the rupture likelihood is much more likelihood in the, for the posterior medial valve uh, leaflets and the corresponding papilla because the, that one is supplied only by the posterior descending. Meanwhile, the anterior lateral is supplied by both the LAD and the left circumflex, so it has a dual blood supply, so it's quite, um, it's quite protected in that regard. Um, on the left, you can see this ultrasound image of the valve leaf flapping in the wind. It has a bit of a wacky, wild, inflatable two-man appearance. 
Um, and on the right side, you can see chest x-ray, which actually is a pretty unique finding of unilateral pulmonary edema. Because if you think about it, your mitral valve points towards the apex of your heart at the left lower chest. So if you were to track that directly backwards, you'll end up towards the right side of your left atrium where your pulmonary vasculature is exiting. So that's how you get that directional jet, which causes a more directional pulmonary edema. Of course, if it's bad enough, you can just get it on both sides. The treatment of choice here is dibutamine. However, these patients can be so hypotensive, you may need to temporize with norepinephrine first um, just to get a perfusion pressure that's compatible with life. You can then reduce that norepinephrine as soon as possible once you've stabilized them on dibutamine. Goes without saying these patients need surgery as soon as possible, and all of the medical management we're doing is not uh, by any means definitive treatment. Final thing for aortic stenosis, much, usually much more of a chronic disease that will become unstable for some other reason. So actually the most common valvular lesion affecting about two to three percent of adults over age 65 and over 10 percent over age 80, um, which and as, as we have an aging population, we're probably going to see a lot more of it. You can see on this diagram that the LV pressures are actually skyrocketing above the aortic pressures, which are the green line. Um, that's because the choke point of the aortic valve doesn't actually allow for equilibration of pressures. If your systole lasted for longer, more of that pressure could pass on to the aorta. So it's kind of like trying to inflate a balloon through a straw. It's a lot of effort, takes a lot of time. So a couple of uh, key points for aortic stenosis, uh, one of them being afterload, which usually you would think is the enemy. But an important part about afterload is that while your heart perfuses the rest of your body, then the rest of your body, or really your aorta, is what's pushing that pressure back into the coronary arteries during diastole. So if you look at this bottom line here, uh, the green dotted line represents your coronary blood flow. And you'll see that it's actually higher in diastole during systole, which I think most people know. But um, what that means is that you well, that's the only time that you're actually going to be perfusing your coronary arteries. So if you're having um, too fast of a heart rate and you're spending less time in diastole, you may not perfuse your coronary arteries as well. As far as the, um, that, the other aspect of dealing with afterload in aortic stenosis is that if you're dealing with a tight valve as you are on the right side of the image, where you have uh, pressure that's struggling to get past it, your LV pressure is much higher than your aorta. And while your afterload is still important um, and too high of an afterload is still a problem, these patients are described as having a relatively fixed afterload. So giving them more afterload is not actually as much of a problem as you'd expect. Um, it can be too much. And if you even very small changes in blood pressure can cause um, significant improvements in cardiac output. But between the fact that you're not causing big problems with increased afterload and you may need a cor perfuser coronaries, especially with um, this thickened left ventricular wall here, you might act, if the person's hypotensive, you might actually want to give them a little bit of afterload support. And because in order to support blood pressure, you have to either um, increase, you have to either affect the vasculature or you have to affect the heart. The problem about affecting your contractility here is that um, most agents that increase contractility are also going to increase your rate. So um, increasing your rate will shorten your amount of time in diastole. And like blowing through a straw, your heart needs to have these long, you need to have powerful contractions, but need to have long and sustained ones in order to actually eject a significant amount of its EF. So you actually want to keep these people slow and you don't want to increase their heart rate. And you need, if you're going to need to increase your blood pressure, phenylephrine might be actually what you reach for. The long diastole time also helps them to optimize their preload. You, these patients, um, because this disease process is almost always chronic, are going to have thick LV walls, which means that they're going to have a harder, they're going to have a degree of diastolic dysfunction. And keeping their preload optimized is going to be key. A longer diastolic time can help with this. Um, and remember, you know, we're talking about this uh, afterload being a compromise. It, the, all of these are temporizing measures. Management here is actually the opposite of your aortic regurgitation management. So you're going to want to keep your rates low. Um, your contractility would be nice if it was high. Usually it already is. Um, what this ultimately means is that you're going to be wanting to avoid beta blockers and calcium channel blockers because that, or at least of the ones that are cardioactive, 
you're going to be fixing any high heart rate causes. AFib can actually be pretty, can cause these patients to decompensate pretty rapidly. Um, there are some medications that increase contractility without increasing heart rate as much. Milrinone comes to mind, but I don't, but that's usually not using the ED. The half-life is, is a little too long for us to titrate and it's renally eliminated. Um, the afterload is the thing you're going to be able to modify a little bit more. The patient's hypotensive, phenylephrine can be useful. If you're really trying, if the patient's hypertensive causing um, some kind of CHF or APE type phenomenon, or if you're uh, really carefully trying to optimize uh, nitroprusside or calcium channel blocker might be the medication of choice. So just as far as some left heart valvular lesions, just to get some basic generalizations for how to approach them if you see one of them in front of you who's crashing. Regurgitation, you're going to want to decrease afterload and increase heart rate and contractility. For stenosis, you're going to want to maintain your afterload to at least a sustainable level. Can consider afterload support if you need to support their blood pressures if they're hypertensive. Meanwhile, you might actually, you may want to reduce it, but that's more of an optimization thing than a, and may not be what's bringing them in as critically ill. You're going to want to keep their heart rate slow and you're going to want to not increase it um, and you're going to avoid atrial fibrillation. For aortic lesions, you can favor preload a little bit. They can handle the volume a little bit better than mitral lesions. So you're just gonna have to be cautious. You're gonna, you should be cautious in all of these patients because if the process is chronic, it, they can easily have accumulated fluid. If it's acute, they could might be either way. The treatment really needs to be individualized here. A lot of these treatments, uh, when people say increase the heart rate, you, some people say for a target a heart rate of aortic regurg, it's 90 and other people say 110. You're really going to have to figure out what's right for your patient because everyone's heart is different. These patients are great candidates for getting an A-line and sitting there and turning the knobs and increasing the pumps and seeing what works for your patient. There are other valves. Um, I, we're not going to go into too much depth into this today, but, but there are approaches that you can generalize. Uh, just keep in mind, you're going to want to switch around your ideas of where afterload is um, because your left heart is aortic pressure, but your right heart is pulmonary artery pressure. Um, also, keep in mind if any of these patients are getting ventilation, um, your PEEP can, will increase your PA pressures, it'll decrease your preload across the board, but it technically increases afterload for your RV while lowering it for your LV. Um, and meanwhile, hypoxia will cause pulmonary artery constriction, which is something you're going to just need to be careful of and think about while you're taking care of these problems. Talk about some of the options we have to also help temporize our patients while waiting for definitive care. Intraortic balloon pumps are a great way to reduce afterload while improving diastolic blood pressure. We have a diagram here of the heart in diastole on the left where the heart is uh, not contracting and the balloon is inflated, which pushes balloon, or which, um, apologies, pushes blood back towards um, the heart. So you have to have an intact aortic valve. You can't use one of these in aortic regurg. And this actually improves coronary perfusion pressure. Uh, but meanwhile, in systole, it actually deflates, which allows the heart to eject forward and gives you a little bit of afterload reduction. These balloons are timed either in EKG or they're pressure timed. Um, they used to not be able to be used in atrial fibrillation. They're still less optimal, but they can actually be used now. Um, the balloon's filled with helium because it won't cause gas emboli and actually is less turbulent flow, so it can flow back and forth more easily. This is a great way to add work to your system without increasing myocardial workload. Of course, you can't use it in aortic structural disease or, either, or as you mentioned, aortic regurgitation. And heparinization may be an issue. People argue about it, whether or not these people need to be fully intercoagulated. This seems like a really cool idea. Um, however, the studies are not actually that promising. Um, these, studies aren't, uh, these studies aren't from valvular lesions specifically. So it's not impossible that these could be uh, used as a bridge to definitive treatment. But there's a couple of studies where, uh, in including randomized control trials, where there are no significant improvement in 30-day mortality for cardiogenic shock. Um, and then for those who are going directly to PCI, because the thought was you could, um, aug you could augment your coronary perfusion pressure, but it seems like if you do a balloon pump with PCI, you don't actually have a reduction in infarct size compared to doing PCI alone, which begs the question of why are we even doing it? An impel is a much simpler version of, the, uh, of a mechanical support device. You place a device that crosses the aortic valve, sits in the left ventricle, 
sucks blood out through a propeller and dumps it right into the aorta. Um, this is a lot more mechanically simple. It's easier to operate. Um, it's better in AFib because it's not synchronized to rate and it's not contraindicated for any valve elevation. There are versions of the left heart between the LV and the aorta as well as, and there are right heart versions as well for between the right ventricle and the pulmonary outflow tract. Looks super cool and you'd think it'd be an improvement from your uh, intraaortic balloon pump, but unfortunately um, there's there also isn't terrific evidence here. There's no real improvement in mortality for cardiogenic shock patients um, when compared to an intra-aortic balloon pump, which of course we already know doesn't work. Um, there's another, uh, I'm sorry, there's another study from 2019 where impressively they cross-matched their own patients to a trial that had already been published, so they knew what they were comparing to. That trial didn't show benefit. Um, and despite the fact that they were stacking the odds in their favor, they also found no improvement in mortality. A um, couple of different things here, a little less AKI, a little more bleeding, but none of it was um, supremely significant. There's some temporizing options for stenotic valves. Um, there's something called a balloon valvuloplasty. For most of the interventions affecting the mitral valve, interestingly enough, the uh, devices usually actually come from the venous side and cross through the atrial septum in order to go into the right atrium and then pop right into the mitral valve. You inflate a balloon and this can help break open the crunchy leaflet valves. Uh, as far as uh, the aorta, there's a couple of different approaches for this. Um, and this can be used and has been advocated for as patients who are not surgical candidates as a temporizing measure if their aortic stenosis is so bad they can't function. You give them a balloon valvuloplasty, you give them a little bit of time to recover, and then potentially move on to definitive treatment. Um, no one's really... I didn't find any evidence of anyone using this as a sole procedure except in pediatrics, where for congenital uh, cardiac diseases, the outcomes are actually a lot better, although they may still need re-ballooning. Uh, um, but for adults, uh, for aortic stenosis, mortality is still high with an eventual mortality that was actually improved from prior of 8.8% in 2010 and 30% in complications. They might need re-ballooning, and even your most successful cases will get some benefit, but within about a uh, year or a little bit more, they may eventually revert back to the course of any aortic stenosis patient. Mitral valve flipping is an interesting option for those horrible papillary muscle ruptures. Um, you again cross through the left, through the atrial septa, you cross down into the mitral valve and you lower a device through the leaflets, pull it back, clasp onto the leaflets of the valve, and clip it and you leave that clip there. And what you end up with is a double outlet mitral valve. Um, of course, you're blocking part of the valve exit pathway. So if you now have a little bit of equivalent of mitral stenosis, it's, um, it's almost to be expected. And you can still, of course, have regurgitation with this. About 20 to 25% of these fail and require surgery anyway. Uh, most of the studies compared these patients to low risk surgical candidates. Um, people who are candidates for surgery should probably get it. Uh, however, this is a good thing that's for temporizing because this you can do in a cath lab while a patient is mitral valve leaflets are blowing all over the place. Um, so if someone is about to die on you and you think that they're not going to survive the inducement of intubation or having a sternotomy, this might get you there. As far as treatment options for valve replacement, um, there is the classic um, trans catheter or percutaneous uh, valve replacement. This shows you a couple of different approaches for an aortic valve. Um, this might make many more people candidates for valve replacement because this is a lot easier to place. Um, the comparison is, of course, against doing an open surgery. This is a really interesting um, case series out of India where people have been using not full anesthesia, they've been using an epidural in the neck. Um, and they say they actually have better uh, hemodynamic outcomes, but there isn't anything, I, I haven't seen any published numbers about how they're doing, but there's a couple of folks who are making a, a case for it in select patients. Um, this patient's 23. Um, so uh, as far as comparing these two, um, the, Transcatheter versus open have similar rates of mortality in stroke for aortic valve. The transcatheter unsurprisingly has more perivalvular leak because you're relying on your balloon inflation to stick the valve in there. 
because you, you, you can't test the leak yourself um, while the patient's on bypass by pushing blood through it. Um, meanwhile, surgery has most po more post-operative AFib. Um, if you have anything uh, serious, like a dissection, like endocarditis, like an inclusion MI or anything else, you're probably just going to need the open heart surgery. Um, but there might be more room for using the transcatheter approach for temporizing patients, including patients who are sick and coming straight from our recess bay. As far as our patient's rest of his course on day three, he was transferred to Bellevue, uh, intubated on Levo and Bezo. Uh, at Bellevue, they changed him over to a regimen of dopamine to increase his heart rate, nitroprusside to lower his afterload, and isoproteranol, which uh, successfully can do both. Um, he was extubated but re-intubated, um, and finally, after a pretty prolonged uh, pre-operative workup, he got his surgery about 14 days in from his compared to his presentation. Um, V-fib arrested the next day, and because his QT was long, he was prophylactically v paced to 100 uh, with a lidocaine drip, which was eventually dc to PO, max latin, and peace, and the pacing was discontinued. Got a pick line for prolonged to ANSEF and was discharged to subcute rehab. A couple of takeaways. Physical exam is not dead yet. This is faster than an echo. It's faster than anything else. And if you have this plus a fever in a drug user, or if you have this in someone who you know has a million cardiac issues, it can point to different ways you might orient your resuscitation. Valves are part of POCUS too. Just take a look at them at the very least. You don't have to get those fancy measurements on everyone, but it's worth knowing how to do them if you ever feel the need. Regurgitation is fast. Heart rates and low afterloads are going to be what favors you. And stenosis is going to be slow heart rates for a nice long systole and a nice long diastole. Your afterload, you're going to want to maintain it, um, at least to the point where they're uh, maintaining a perfusion pressure. After that, um, C2 surgery and everyone else can handle it. And if you have a pulmonary edema that's not improving or someone with a cardiogenic shock but with an intact ejection fraction, that's worth taking a further look at. Huge thank you to a lot of people here. Huge thank you to the EMCCM team who really helped me pare this down into something that I could successfully give in less than four hours. Huge thank you to a lot of folks who were both involved in the patient's care. Dr. Corey and Dr. Douglas helped to keep this patient alive uh, with, and uh, taught me about the patient while uh, I was on my MICU rotation. Um, brought a lot of help with reviewing this PowerPoint as well. Thanks to all of you. Uh, a lot of ultrasound folks who helped me out with the um, with some of the more technical aspects of the echo. And while I did have this interesting patient, Dr. Camacho and the SIM department gave me a really rowdy uh, SIM case of someone with papillary muscle rupture. That patient was really sick, and I think they only kept the patient alive to be nice to me. But um, that caused me to go into this deep hole of reading. And I really appreciate the teaching they gave me on the spot and the teaching they inspired. I'm looking forward to our sim coming back anytime now. A uh, whole lot of citations. I can go into this uh, for anyone who has any particular questions. Thank you everyone for your time.